singing. First one was a bit dodgy, right? <laughs> but no matter, we got through. We're going into communion, and we have a few moments of silence for prayer. So our communion is so important, but we need to prepare ourselves for what it means to you. But, uh, bow our heads for a few moments and prepare yourself for Christ. See the young way to with the vote given out and when you take our take together. We're going to read from Stuart. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter eleven and verse twenty-three. Paul is writing and says, For I receive from the Lord, for I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my God. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And remember, that's what Jesus said, it's in remembrance of what Christ on the cross. The bread represents his body, and the wine represents his blood. And Christ said, remember, the cross for him. In one way, it's a celebration for us, that Jesus, through his great love for us, went to the cross, and paid the price of the ransom to buy his back. And the amazing thing about it is, it's free. And as we partake now in this, remember, think of Christ hanging on the cross. Think of his love for you, me, and all a man. Understand that the whole thing is about this. For Christ in Calvary, and Christ in his resurrection. And this is a great moment to get clarity in our head. The world kind of tries to pull these awakenings. And this is getting back to Calvary. And what Christ done, what Christ achieved at that moment in time. Two elements in your hand, a piece of bread and the wine, to represent the body and the blood of Christ. So let's partake. Children can 
Reading from um, uh, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Then after fourteen years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, although quietly before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised. Though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we need not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I say who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that, um, sorry, uh, just as Peter had been entrusted to the gospel to the circumcised, but he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. When James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to them, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the Paul, the very thing I was eager to do. Verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood and because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically uh, along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we can believe in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in our endeavour to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. 
For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For though, uh, for through the law I died to the law, and that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Amen. Shall we uh, pray? Lord God, as we uh, come uh, to your word this morning, uh, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we are justified by faith. Lord, that we are justified by faith in you. Lord, that it's nothing, Lord, that we do, nothing, Lord, that we could do, that enables us to be right with you. Other than Jesus' death and resurrection. Lord, that we we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We ask, we just ask, Lord, that this morning as we look at your word, that you will open it afresh to us, Lord, that you will encourage us, Lord, that you will teach us. And Lord, that uh, through uh, what we learn today, Lord, that we will move closer to you uh, in our love and our devotion to you. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Couple of uh, technical difficulties here. Let's see if we can try and sort this out. There we are. Sorts of each other. It's great. This morning we're, we're looking, we're, we're continuing in, in our. Uh, series on Galatians. Last week, you remember, we, we looked at the fact that uh, we were called by God to live a life for Him. And we looked at Paul's testimony, we looked at uh, how, how the fact that uh, trusting what Paul says, trusting that Paul is, has been appointed an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, is so central to our understanding of most of uh, the New Testament because he wrote so much of it. And if he's, he has no authority to write that, he does not speak for God, then we need to actually disregard about two-thirds of the New Testament. We need to disregard about two-thirds of our doctrines. Because a lot of it we get, uh, and our understanding of it we get from Paul's writing. And we, we looked at uh, Paul, he, he was called by God, he gave us his testimony, he told us what it was like before he met Christ, how he met Christ, and what it was like now he was in Christ. And we noticed that the central theme of this book, the central theme of the book of Galatians, is that we are saved by grace through faith. And we're going to see more of that this week, as he continues to unpack his introduction to to what he's going to say about us uh, as he's laying the groundwork uh, to remind the church in Galatia, which he planted, which he was instrumental in them coming to Christ, that he does have the authority to teach in the name of Jesus Christ. And this week we're going to look at this uh, idea of this, this word justified by faith. Uh, it's the first time he actually mentions it here in, in this letter. And we're going to unpack that a little bit uh, this morning. And we're going to continue to look at how Paul defends himself and the gospel against false teachers. Have you ever made a mistake? Put your hand up if you've never made a mistake. <laughs> Of course, we all know that. We all make mistakes. We all get things wrong. And I, in preparing, I came across this story and I, and I was laughing so much when I, uh, uh, when I was reading it. Uh, but at the same time, not 
because it was serious. And it was a story of a man who lived in Long Island in, in America, uh, and he, he particularly liked um, uh, gadgets and, and equipment, and a bit like me, I guess, uh, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm into gadgets and, and things like that. I, I like to have uh, these things. Uh, and and he, he had an ambition to own the best uh, barometer there is and be able to tell him uh, what the weather is going to be doing. Uh, and he, um, he manages to buy the best there is, top of the range. And then when, he finally, when it finally arrives at his time, it's been delivered um, and he, he, he opens it and then he's disappointed immediately. Because the, uh, the needle appears to be stuck. And it's stuck to the scepter that is marked hurricane. And he's shaking it about, he's trying to get it to work, and it won't work. So he decides in a huff, he writes a very strongly worded letter to the shop where he bought it. The next morning, on his way to New York, as he's uh, going to work, he posts this letter and he thinks, thinks rather good of himself that he's been able to, you know, give them a, a piece of his mind. He works all day, oblivious to whatever's going on in the world. He arrives home and he can't find his barometer or his house. A hurricane had passed through. <laughs> he quite clearly was wrong. There was nothing wrong with the apparatus, it was him that was wrong. <clears throat> Paul is dealing with, with a group of people that says there's nothing wrong with Jesus, there's nothing wrong with God, it is Paul that's got it wrong. And they're shaking him, they're trying to make sure that he's got it right. And Paul is standing firm and says, no, I'm telling you, the hurricane is coming, if you like. I am pointing to the right direction. We're going to look, as, as, as we look at this week, as we look at how Paul continues to defend himself, as he continues to prove that he's pointing his needle in the right direction, if you like. That he, he tells us a couple of things about both the gospel, but also his place within the leadership of the church. He tells us about his visit to Jerusalem in verses 1 to 10, and we'll unpack that in a minute. He tells us about an incident when Peter comes to join him in Antioch. And we'll look at that in verses 11 to 14. And then in verses 15 to the end of the chapter, he introduces us to this idea that we are justified, that we are made right with God by faith. He's already told us we're saved by faith, but now he's going to tell us what that means. It means we are made right with God through faith. Verses 15 to 21. Let's back up a little bit as, as we look at the first 10 verses of uh, Galatians chapter 12. Uh, chap Galatians chapter 2, sorry. <laughs> See, we all make mistakes. <laughs> uh, in verse 4, we read these words. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom we have in Christ Jesus, so that they may bring us into slavery. One of the things I think we, we notice here is that these people that Paul is talking about, he's actually talking about people who are church attenders. They're religious. They're, they're at everything. They're at the prayer meetings, they're at the Bible studies, they're at the worship services of their day. One thing he's telling us is that religious, religious people can often work against the freedom we have in 
Christ Jesus. Religious people, the by religious people, I mean, those who, who they go, they ran everything, but it stayed in their head. And they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. They work against the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. They actively pursue it. It's, it's about to dotting the I's and crossing the T's. In, in the letter of the law, we have to do everything absolutely right. Every time. Otherwise, we're not right with God. Paul refutes that in this letter. And so one thing Paul is saying in verse 5, we did not yield to them in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved in you. It is given to you, it is to be preserved in you, and you are to pass it on to the next generation. As it was given to you. Resist religion. Resist religion in order to preserve the truth of the gospel. Now, of course, we all know that going to church services and Bible studies and prayer are all good, and we're not saying don't do those things. What we're saying is it's, we're not performing for God. We're not performing for each other even. It's about our relationship with God. It's about preserving the truth of how we come to God and how we can be right with God so that we can live with him and for him in this world while we wait for the world to come. It is not about religious performance. Paul's primary goal in this letter is to preserve the truth of the gospel. That's why he's telling us, that's why he's telling us what happened. So that we know that even right at the very beginning, of what we would, would have called Christendom or Christianity, whatever uh, we want to call it, right at the very beginning there was opposition to the truth of the gospel within the church. Remember last week we said that our greatest problem isn't outside the church, it's not persecution, it's not those who deny Christ Jesus. Our greatest problem is those who are in, inside the church who are trying to head up false teaching. Whatever the reason for that is. And we need to resist. We need to hold firm to the truth of the gospel as we see in Scripture. In sharing the news of his visit to Jerusalem, Paul shows that there is no division between Peter and Paul and the gospel that they preach. Well, one of the accusations against uh, Paul was the fact that there was division amongst the apostles. That there was disagreement between them as to what was the true gospel. By uh, reminding the Galatians of this visit, of our grace and doubt for us, it is showing us, as he was said, that there is no division between Peter and Paul. Remember, Peter was the one that Jesus said that um, he, he would, he would uh, call him, instead of um, Simon, we call him Peter because uh, he, was, he was a rock, he was the one that was to feed the sheep, he was, he was the one who was going to shepherd God's people in those early days. He was the first one to publicly declare amongst the disciples that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. And on that truth, God, Christ, will build his church. On that truth, that he is the Son of God. He is the Chosen One. He is the Messiah who has come to pay the price of our sins and reconcile us to the Father through his death. 
and whose resurrection is proof of that. And that truth, that rock, Jesus will build his church. But Peter was the one who was going to lead it. With the other apostles. And so by saying there was discord between them, they're saying, well, clearly Peter's not wrong. <laughs> it must be Paul. The other apostles are all in agreement. It's Paul that's different. Therefore, we can ignore him. By showing there's no difference, no division between himself and Peter, he's showing them there's, no, there's only one gospel. And that Paul has as much authority to preach and to teach as Peter does. Paul, in, in these verses, is not being derogatory to Peter or the early apostles. He's simply showing that he is equal with them. That he's an apostle as well, and they're an apostle, but they're no different to him. That is, that the uh, gospel that they're preaching is the same, it is one. That the whole of the New Testament, the Old Testament too, consistently teaches the one gospel. And we see also that Paul is in full agreement with the Jerusalem church. And they with him. He says they added nothing to it. So, um, and Titus wasn't even compelled to be circumcised to submit to this call uh, to uh, Judaize the uh, Gentile church. Even he wasn't obliged to do so. Of course, in the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, he can choose to, if he wanted to, or not. But he is not obliged. It is one gospel. There is no disagreement between Peter and Paul. There is no disagreement between the Gentile church and the uh, Jerusalem church. Between the leadership there and the leadership in Antioch. They are in full agreement. Nothing is added to the gospel that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That we are made right. We are justified by that faith. All they did was to remind them to remember the Paul. Because the same God, the same grace, the same Spirit who gifts all believers was at work in both the church in Jerusalem and the church in uh, Antioch and the rest of the Gentile world. And they would say in verse 10, we remind you to remember the Paul. The Paul was the, the Paul amongst the believers, uh, first and foremost. And of course we know that the church in Jerusalem was actually the one that was suffering the most. They were probably the, the one that was uh, in the most need in the early days. And of course we know in, in other letters that um, uh, Paul organised a collection amongst the Gentile churches to support the churches in Jerusalem. He says that it's a very thing we were eager to do. We didn't want anyone to be in need amongst that number. So whatever the need was, the needs were met. Do you remember the church in Acts chapter 2? They met their needs. As if I have something and you don't, and you need it, I can share it, I can give it, I can... And so on and so forth. That's the way the church is meant to be. And it is an outworking of the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. So it's a practical outworking of the salvation that we have in Jesus that we want to support each other. We want to love each other. We're reminded that again this morning in Peter's writing. Love one another. Because of Christ Jesus. 
church in Jerusalem saying to Paul, love one another because of Christ Jesus. Paul tells us, love one another because of Christ Jesus. Jesus himself, as he's going to the cross in the upper room in, in the Gospel of John, remember he says, the world will know that you're mine by the fact that you love one another. How do we show that we love each other? We meet each other's needs. We put, I put your needs above my own. That shows I love you. And vice versa. Remember the poor. It's how we show the world that the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus, the justification that we have in Christ Jesus actually has made a difference in our lives. So then we move on in verses 11 uh, to 14. And, and we see Peter in, in Antioch this time. It's Peter doing the visiting. Uh, Paul calls him Cephas. He's a, a, a Jewish uh, version of, of, of Peter. And, and he... By, by including this, he's showing us that even the best, the most mature believer, when he listens to the wrong voices, makes mistakes and goes astray. Peter, the first leader amongst the disciples after Jesus has ascended to heaven. Part of Jesus' inner group of three from the twelve apostles amongst the tens, you know, 150 or so um, disciples. Peter, who had received that vision, you remember, in, in Acts, uh, um, where he, he's, he's on the rooftop and he has a vision three times. God gives it to him to really enforce the point, to really hammer his own to Peter. Well, I have made clean, do not call them clean. And he knew immediately what it meant, because immediately he goes to Cornelius' house. And he says, God has shown me that you are as saved as I am, you are justified as I am, that you are as clean as I am, that it's okay for me to come and share fellowship with you, even though you're a Gentile and I'm a Jew. It's okay because the same spirit that God gave me, he has given you. The same salvation he has given me, he has given you. Peter knew it. Peter was happy sharing fellowship with the Gentile believers in Antioch and probably anywhere else. He was living as though he was a Gentile, if you like. That's the very thing that Paul accuses him of. You, you live like a Gentile, and yet you want the Gentiles to live like Jews. By withdrawing, and when, when a group of people come from the church in Jerusalem, James, the uh, brother of Jesus, was, was the leader of the church, and it wasn't uh, John's brother, uh, James. Uh, he was already martyred by this point. It was uh, Jesus' brother James, who, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem at, at this point. And uh, a group of people from that church come to Antioch and says, Peter, you shouldn't be doing this. In uh, Acts, in, in, the, uh, in Luke's uh, writing of this incident, James says, I, I never said them. They never went with my authority. But they claimed to have come with the authority of James, who was an apostle of Jesus. And because rather than uh, arguing with Peter, just simply follows him and withdraws and separates himself from sharing fellowship with fellow believers. Sharing fellowship with fellow believers. In other words, he was saying, we may 
believe the same things, who may have been saved the same way, but I'm putting a different barrier on to you as to what I find acceptable in order to share fellowship with you. I'm putting conditions on us being united in Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul says, he's putting conditions on the gospel. He's adding something to it. Even though he knows the truth. What was Peter's problem here? Other than the fact that it gives rise to that the Judaizers uh, were right and that you need, uh, you need to, to follow the law as well as believing Jesus to be saved. Peter didn't believe that. He believed the gospel. But he failed to practice it. He failed to put it into practice. He failed to love his Gentile brothers. He lacked the courage of his conviction. He chose to please man rather than God. Because remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he chose to please him. He chose to save himself rather than stand with Jesus, which is the very thing Jesus said he would do. And then when he realized he was bitterly disappointed, I'm sure in this instance when uh, Paul is talking to them, I'm sure he's bitterly disappointed in himself because he knows what he's done. He chose to please man rather than God. Paul would not let this go. Paul would not let it go. Why? Because the truth was at stake. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, that we are saved. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, that we are made right with God. And therefore, because we are right with God, we can share fellowship together. There is no distinction between Jew or Gentile. We are both sinners, uh, Paul reminds us. We are both sinners. When he says in verse 15, uh, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, He's not saying we're not sinners. He said even as Jews, we are sinners. And we are saved by grace through faith. If God justifies Jews and Gentiles on the same terms, shows no difference between them, who are we to add a difference? Who are we to withhold fellowship from one another? Peter was withholding his fellowship from the uncircumcised Gentiles. If God accepts them, who are we to reject them? So some of the takeaways, I guess, as we look at Paul opposing Peter again, well, by doing that, he's showing that he is a fellow apostle with Peter and that he has authority to do that. Just as Peter has authority to do it to Paul, when Paul is wrong. <laughs> One of the things is we, we, we can take from this is we can ask ourselves, what conditions do we put on people before we Accept fellowship with them. What does somebody needs to what do uh, somebody needs to do for us to accept fellowship with someone who has been saved by grace through faith? Do we add conditions before we share fellowship together? The only condition is are we in Christ Jesus? Are we in Christ Jesus? Have we been saved by faith, by grace through faith? We come on to verses 15 to 21 where Paul really starts to introduce the fact that we are justified by faith and which is going to unpack 
to the rest of the letter. As I said, when he, when he calls um, uh, Gentile sinners, it's actually saying the same thing in two different words. In, in Jewish culture, uh, and uh, at the time Paul is writing in literature, you will often see the two were interchangeable, Gentile and sinners. Gentile is anyone who is not a Jew. In other words, anyone who has not been given the law of God, who, hasn't been, who God hasn't revealed himself to through the giving of his word. So therefore they're automatically sinners. But of course Paul is at pain to remind us that even Jews, even those of us who um, are religious, who have the word of God, are sinners until we are saved by grace through faith. And even then, we're not perfect, even then we still have that battle within us as we continually crucify the old life. So that we can live the new life in Christ Jesus. Both are interchangeable. The nations that do not keep the law are automatically sinners. The Paul, as I say, is saying that we are all sinners. As the law doesn't make us right with God. The law does not make us right with God. Keeping the law does not make us right with God. Yes, God calls us to obedience in Christ Jesus. But keeping the law in and of itself does not make us right with God. It cannot make us right with God. Remember what the law was given for. It was to show us that we were sinners and we cannot please God in our own strength. That we, we need God to do something for us. We need God to cleanse us of our sin. And the way God does that is by sending his son to die on the cross. By putting our faith, our trust in Him and His death and His resurrection, we are made right with Him. See, the problem with justification by works, that is by trying to keep the law, trying to please God by what we do, tells us that if we try a bit harder, if we try a bit harder, if we do a bit better, we will be saved. We will get to live in eternity with God. The problem with that is, is we can never get good enough. We can never do it well enough. That's not because God is, it's impossible to please God, but because God has the best standards. He's the one by which every standard is measured by. And we're not God. Sorry to shatter your delusions, sir. We are not God. So it doesn't matter how good we are, it's never going to measure up. But justification by works says that if we try and get out of it, do a bit better, then maybe we'll be saved. This is the biggest lie that has ever been told. That we can work our way into favour with God. It's a delusion. We cannot do it. Justification by faith shatters this delusion, shatters it. Because it tells us that it doesn't matter what we do, it's in whom we trust. That matters. It's in what Christ has done for us that matters. So we can rest in that, not to go on sinning. Paul is quite clear on that in this letter and in others. It's not so that we can go on sinning, it's so that we can live with God. So that we can rest in being right with God through Jesus. Justified by Jesus, by faith in Jesus Christ, not by works of the Lord, verse 16. 
Faith means to trust. When we put our faith in something, we trust it, we believe it, we act on that trust. That's what we mean by faith. When we talk about law, we're talking about religious practice, working to gain favour with God. We also mean the first five books of the Bible. We also mean the Mosaic law and anything to do with it, such as the rabbinic teaching about the law. But when Paul talks about the law, this is what he's talking about. It also means all Jewish religious teaching and literature. So we automatically see it's gone much further than simply the word of God. When Paul says the law, and so when we talk about the law, we're not just talking about the very precise word of God. We're talking about everything that has got been added on to it as well. We do it ourselves, don't we? In the Baptist church, in every church, we all do it. We, we like to add things on. Justification in the New Testament always refers to the forgiveness of sinners. It's a sinners who have been forgiven, who have been made right with God. If God treats a sinner like me as righteous as he does in Christ Jesus, then, then I'm righteous. Not because of me, not you're righteous, not because of you. It is simply because our sins have been wiped out. We have been made just. We have been made righteous. Amen. We have been made right with God. Through the death of Jesus Christ. And by trusting in his death, his completed work. Paul reminds us in verse 17 that Christ is not a servant of sin. And Lord, it's not so that we can go on sinning. Not so that we can go on living the life that we used to live. Whether it was a religious life or a life that is obviously far from God. It's not so that we can go on living our past life. It's so that we can actually be free to follow him into obedience. He is not a servant of sin. When I sin, it's not Christ making me sin because I'm free in Him. I'm sinning because I've chosen to ignore His voice and follow my own voice. Follow the world's voice. Like Peter, follow the voice of those who, are, who seem to be okay and will actually lead me down the gathered path. A Christian who is in Christ Jesus is not free to sin. In Christ the old things have passed away and the old things are becoming new. We recognise that Jesus' death and resurrection are not just historical events. Yes, it is something that happened in history, but it's something that is also outside of history. We recognise that we too share in him through faith. We too have been crucified with Christ Jesus. When we trust in him and his death and his resurrection, we too have been crucified with Christ Jesus. The old man, the sinful man, has died. It's not to say we're incapable of sinning, but that the sinner in us has died. And we now live, we have been raised with Christ Jesus to a new life, to live with him in faith, to live a life of obedience through faith. So it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. It's not, I, you know, I no longer want to sin. I want to please God. Do I always do it? No. Do I still sin? Yes. But it's then that I need to remember that I need to crucify that sin, that sin, 
that time. I need to come back to the cross. I need to rise again in the new life that I have. And he goes on in verse 18, he says, do not start to rebuild your life with works of the Lord. Do not go back to what you used to. Do not rest in what you used to rest in. Do not rely on it. Because that life is not gone. For starters. And secondly, he didn't say you in the first place. Where do you think he's going to now? Returning to the Lord to obtain righteousness inevitably makes us a sinner. All over again. Because all who try to follow the Lord fall short of perfection. It reminds us that we fall short of the glory of God. That's what the Lord is there for. And by relying on it, it's what we're relying on. Rather than the finished work of Christ. Trying to be justified by the works of the Lord automatically carries with it failure. We're reminded in these verses that law equals death, but Christ equals life. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me, verse 22. What does Paul mean by that? He means that our character has changed, our heart has changed, our priorities have changed. It is not just our standing before God which has changed, which he has. It is all of ourselves radically, permanently changed. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Therefore, pull off the old self and pull on the new self. Therefore, live in obedience, not out of obligation, but out of love for Christ Jesus. We have moved from rebellion against God to wanting to please Him, wanting to be with Him. And we remind you that this is only possible through faith, through faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. Faith, remember, is trust. Trusting that Christ's death and resurrection has paid the price for us, for your sin, for my sin, in full. It is finished, Jesus said. That through Christ you are fully reconciled with God and no one can take you away from him. That God's plans for you are the best. How do we show that we trust God? By doing things His way, waiting for His time. Every time I say to God, I think I can do better, I think my way is better than your way, I'm relying on myself again. I'm doing what Adam and Eve did. I'm doing what every person I have since then has done. Trust in that God's plans for you are the best. That He knows better than you do. What's good for you. He says if 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 we if we if that isn't enough, if Justification by, isn't by faith. If salvation isn't by grace through faith, then Christ's death itself was for no purpose. Why does he go to the cross? Why does he die if that in itself is not enough? Because if that isn't enough, well then God is what some people claim he is. A sadistic child abuser who causes his son to die for no reason. Paul defends that charge vehemently. No, Christ's death itself is enough. And it is the only thing we need. Because it was the only thing that could pay the price. Christ did not die for no purpose. He died for the only purpose in which he came. And that is to save sinners. To reconcile them to God the Father. And if we think something else is needed, then we're saying it's not enough. We're saying that 
God sent him for no reason whatsoever. We nullify God's grace if justification by works of the law. I'm sorry, if justification is by works of the law, it is not grace. Christ's death becomes superfluous. Because if it is by our works, if, if our salvation is won by our works, if we, are, if we are saved by our own works, then Christ's work was unnecessary. That's what Paul is saying. To trust in Christ's finished work on the cross alone for salvation is to begin a new life in Him. Do you trust that? Do you believe that? That's the gospel we preach. That's the gospel Peter preached. That's the gospel Paul preached. That's the gospel all the apostles preached. That's the gospel that has been handed down to us through the generations. Let's hold on to it and let's pass it on. Amen. But I call you this morning, if you have not rested in the finished work of Christ yourself, do so today. Today is the day. Today is the day to be reconciled with Christ. So in conclusion this morning, there is one gospel. There's no division between those who are leaders in Christ Jesus. There is one gospel. We need to make sure that we defend this gospel. We need to defend the truth of it. We need to pass it on. And this gospel is that we are saved by grace through, alone, through faith alone. That we are made right with God through this faith. And to go back to works-based salvation says that we reject Christ's finished work. Don't reject his finished work. But accept it. Live in it. Rest in it. And be with God. Shall we pray? Lord God, this uh, morning we thank you, Lord, that uh, you have called us. Lord, that you have saved us by grace through faith in Jesus. And through this faith, Lord, you have justified us. You have made us right with you. Not so that we can go on living life our own way, but so that we are free to live in your way. Without worrying about the way of pleasing you or not, but resting in you. Lord, remind us of that confidence just now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
got June to the 9th of November, 8 o'clock Bible study at James and Nancy's house and John and Michael's house. Wednesday the 10th of November is a Accelerate Youth Meeting at 4 o'clock. Bible study at James and Nancy's. Friday the 12th of November, 8 p.m., the Accelerate Youth Council night at Nancy's and James again. And next Sunday we meet back here at half ten. Accelerate always gets me. <laughs> <laughs> the Word of God brings in here this morning. And if James preached it, it's just mesmerizing God's love. But the connection, see if you can get the connection to home between what I read at the beginning in 1 Peter, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and Galatians, Galatians chapter 2. And this is why I picked out the psalm just as I stood there, the psalm 100. And this is why we can do it. Shout for the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is God, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Thank you.